Clouds, yeah, clouds. Um, they get a bad press, don't they? Especially in this country. I mean, have you uh, ever noticed how much people moan about them? Um, I mean, it's written into the English language, all right? Um, it seems to me a kind of negative associations with clouds. If you talk about someone who's down or depressed, you say he's got a cloud hanging over him. Or when there's kind of bad news in store, there's a cloud on the horizon. Um, and I, uh, I think this is uh, a little unfair, um, and I'm going to sort of hopefully explain why. Because I think they're beautiful, don't you? It's just that they're so omnipresent, clouds, right? They're so commonplace, so everyday, that um, we become blind to their beauty. Uh, in fact, it seems to me um, we become blind to the clouds themselves often, uh, unless we only really notice them if they're blocking out the sun, you know, when they get in the way. And so for this reason, they sort of become symbols for the things that get in the way. Symbols for these sort of annoying, frustrating obstructions in life, you know, and that's when then we, everyone rushes off and does some blue sky thinking to get away from that whole sort of those obstructions. Um, but when you stop to ask people, um, most people will admit to um, harboring a, a, a sort of fondness for clouds, all right? They, um, they have one deep down inside, I've found, and it's a kind of nostalgic fondness. The clouds remind them uh, of their youth. We can all remember lying back and finding shapes in the clouds when we were young. Um, and that was back when, you know, our imaginations were perhaps a little bit freer. Um, when we were masters of daydreaming and, and could just let our imaginations drift along. And that's why I think talking about clouds at a festival of, of the imagination is, um, is a very kind of uh, appropriate subject. Um, Aristophanes, the ancient Greek playwright, he described clouds as the patron goddesses of idle fellows. That was two and a half thousand years ago, and you can see what he means. Um, it's just that these days, as adults, I think we rarely allow ourselves the time to let our imaginations drift along in the breeze. We rarely stop what we do. Um, and I think cloud spotting is one salvation, a way that we can encourage that. And, and um, uh, I think we should do more of it. I think, in fact, we should, do, we should be more willing, more prepared to look up at the sunlight bursting out from behind some clouds and go, wait a sec, that looks like two cats dancing the salsa. <laughs> or maybe that big puffy one over there above the shopping center looks like the abominable snowman going to rob a bank. You see his gun up there. A little bit difficult to see with a dark thing. Um, they're like nature's version of, of, of those ink blot images, you know, that shrinks used to show their patients in the 60s. Uh, and I think if you consider the shapes that you see in the clouds, you'll uh, get some indication of your state of mind. Perhaps it will reveal something to you. Perhaps, let's say you're in love, all right? What do you see? Or perhaps the opposite. You've just fallen out of love, or you've been dumped by your partner. Everywhere you look, you see ki kissing couples. <laughs> Perhaps you're having a moment of existential angst, and there on the horizon is the Grim Reaper. <laughs> or maybe you just see a, a topless sunbather. <laughs> I don't know... What would that mean? I don't know. Um, but one thing I do know is this, that clouds are, uh, they're not something to complain about. Um, and I think someone needs to stand up for them, which is why uh, a few years back, I started the Cloud Appreciation Society. And it has now 35,000 members, near enough, 96 countries around the world. And when you become a member, you get a badge, <laughs> and you get a certificate with your name on it, 
We do hereby certify that the person's name was elected as a member of the society on the date and will henceforth seek to persuade all who will listen of the wonder and beauty of clouds. Um, it's, a, um, it's a society which really stands to remind people that far from being something to complain about, um, far from thinking of clouds just as so many inches of rain or hail, they are, in fact, one of the most evocative and poetic aspects of nature. And they are the part of nature which is, in my opinion, the most stimulating to the imagination. Um, so, for this reason, I think if you have your head in the clouds, it will help you keep your feet on the ground. And this is really what I want to show you um, and what I want to demonstrate to you. And I'm going to do so with the help of some of my favorite types of clouds. All these photographs that I'm showing were sent in by members of the Cloud Appreciation Society from around the world, all right? Um, so let's start with um, a friendly little cloud, this one here. Does anybody in the audience, hands up, have any idea what type of cloud this is? Up at the back there. Yes, you at the very back. You put yours up first. It's a cumulus cloud. Absolutely right, cumulus cloud. Round of applause, please. There you go, badge for you. Do you pass that back, please? Cumulus cloud. I mean, it's a good one to start with, the cumulus. The name of it comes from the Latin for stacked or heaped. Um, and I think it's a good one to start with because these feel to me like the kind of generic cloud. All right, if you were to close your eyes and imagine a cloud, this is probably the one that would come to mind. They're like the sort of Simpsons clouds, you know, they're the kind of cartoon clouds. Um, and it's probably for this reason, this kind of um, generic cloud reason, that uh, whenever you see uh, a six-year-old's drawing of a house and uh, a levitating family, um, <laughs> they always put cumulus clouds in the background. I think it's interesting just to spend a moment, just to kind of pause for a moment and just explain to you how these clouds typically form, um, because I find it fascinating. Um, it's, you can explain it by talking about a lava lamp, all right? Um, I don't know whether you know, but in a lava lamp, the, the, the way it works is the bulb at the bottom of the lamp um, not only provides light, it also provides heat. Uh, and in here, we've got a mixture of oil, and wax, liquid wax. And they're almost the same density, but the wax is a bit denser, and so it sinks to the bottom until you switch on the light. When you switch on the light, it warms that wax up a little bit. It expands a little bit, and then it becomes just a little bit less dense than the oil and starts to float upwards in a languid way. And as it rises, it cools. And as it cools, it contracts and then starts to sink back down again. It's called convection. Uh, and believe it or not, exactly the same thing's happening outside on a sunny day, all right? It's obviously not liquids we're dealing with, but gases in the atmosphere. Uh, and in this case, the sun heats up the ground, all right? And the ground acts as the heat source. The interesting point is, some parts of ground uh, will warm the air above them, warm up the low air above the ground more efficiently than other parts. So a ploughed field over here warms the air up more efficiently than a um, bit of woodland. And for that reason, the air here expands and starts floating upwards, and this air comes in to take its place. And this rising column of air is known as a thermal. And when conditions are right, it rises, and as it rises, it cools. And as it cools, some of the moisture in it condenses into droplets. So... Uh, that's one way of talking about clouds, or talking about the sky, in a kind of explaining um, you know, how it works, analytical way. But of course, there's, there's another way. And uh, as was demonstrated by this fellow, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, he said, oh, it is pleasant with a heart at ease, just after sunset or by moonlight skies, to make the shifting clouds be what you please. So that, in fact, he should get a, I think you should get a membership, posthumous membership for that. So that, um, 
that idea of finding shapes in the clouds, well, this is another reason for starting with cumulus, because cumulus clouds are the best ones for finding shapes in. They have crisper edges than, uh, than many of the other types of clouds. And so all those ones I showed you at the beginning, clouds that look like things, those were cumulus clouds. Um, they're the fair weather clouds form on a sunny day, as I showed you. Um, and, you know, you always often see, you know, there's a, there's a cumulus uh, goldfish, uh, a cumulus cloud-spotting bunny, a cumulus large cumulus, this one, uh, dog. Uh, just about, because some of the darkness, d darker bits are lost on this projection. It might be a little bit more difficult to see. Uh, cumulus Salvador Dali. <laughs> you see his moustache here. Could be Billy Connolly, of course. So those um, cumulus clouds remind us of something. They remind us um, of the sort of aimless quality of cloud spotting. Um, and this is one of the things I like about it. Cloud spotting is, is, is an excuse for doing nothing. It legitimizes doing nothing. And I think that's something we need these days. We need excuses to do nothing because there is such an uh, omnipresent feeling that there's stuff we should be doing, answering emails, updating Facebook, whatever it is. Uh, there's always a feeling that there's something we should do. So it's quite good and quite helpful to have an activity which is essentially doing nothing, but feels like you're doing something. Um, so I guess it fits with the whole idea of the idler. Um, I co-founded the Idler magazine 20 years ago, and, and the two, um, these two kind of concepts uh, are somewhat related. So that was cumulus clouds. How about this one? Those were low clouds, right, made of droplets, water droplets. The high clouds are not generally made of water droplets, but made of ice crystals. Again, a little bit difficult to see on this dark projection. Any ideas in the audience of what this one is? Yes, at the back there. It's a cirrus cloud, absolutely right. Enamel badge, all right? Enamel membership badge, if you could pass that one. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please. Cirrus. So yes, cirrus, is, um, that name comes from the Latin for a lock of hair, all right? Um, and these uh, have a very ethereal uh, appearance, wispy, translucent appearance. They, they consist of ice crystals cascading from the upper reaches of the troposphere, which is the part of our atmosphere where weather happens. Um, and as these ice crystals fall, they pass through differing winds, all right, because our atmosphere is very stratified. And the different levels, you can have very different um, air conditions, atmospheric conditions, and different wind speeds and different wind directions. And so as they fall, they get whipped in these different directions, known as full streaks. Um, that would be called cirrus in tortoise, which is like um, a twisted, uh, confused uh, cirrus uh, uh, species. The, 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 the main cloud types, there are 10 of them, and they're called genera. It's a bit like the naming of plants and animals. They're called genera, so you've got the genus is, is cirrus, and then you get different species, which are the kind of subdivisions. Um, yeah, so it's like the whole idea for naming, the Latin system for naming plants and animals. They do, sh you do find shapes in the cirrus cloud, so this like like a feather here, or this is somebody having a bad hair day. Um, get a lot of bad hair days in, in clouds, actually, when you see faces. Um, so they do, uh, they're good for finding shapes in as well, as long as they're kind of moving ephemeral shapes. Um, but that's not the reason why I'm mentioning them here. Cirrus clouds I'm mentioning not only because I think they're one of the most beautiful of the basic ten cloud types, but also for this. Those ice crystals up at that level, as high up as that, um, 45,000 feet maybe, 40,000 feet, um, when they're up there, the winds up there are very, very fierce, maybe 200 miles an hour, uh, 300 miles an hour. And so as these ice crystals fall, they're being whipped along in the winds. But of course, from all the way down here, from the distance away that we are down on the ground looking up at them, they appear to be moving gracefully, slowly. In the same way that an aeroplane uh, may be moving very, very fast, but from all the way down here, just because it's so far away, it's, it seems to be going slowly. In fact, most clouds appear to move slowly, change and develop slowly. And so 
To cloud spot is to slow down, to tune yourself in to the shifting movements of the clouds is to slow yourself down. It's like a, an everyday form of meditation, just for a few moments every day. This is why it helps you keep your feet on the ground. Every few minutes, every day, just to take a few minutes to tune out, and you can do it within an urban setting as much as you can within the uh, countryside. You just have to remember to look up because there are so many other things distracting your attention. So, on to the third of the ten main cloud types that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and this is one which is always going to attract your attention. This enormous monster. Um, right, hands up. Any thoughts at all? Down at the front here. It is indeed a cumulonimbus cloud. Uh, 2014 cloud calendar. <laughs> still in January, just about still relevant. Um, cumulonimbus cloud, the king of clouds, the cumulonimbus. And... Uh, this is the enormous beast of the atmosphere, which can stretch 10, 12 miles uh, up into the sky. It's where uh, thunder and lightning are produced. Um, this one here would be described, so that is the main type, the genus. But um, the species in this case would be calvus, meaning bald. Um, when they ha aren't quite so mature, they're described as bald. And once they are, uh, they've been around longer, capillatus, hairy, it's the opposite to people, right? It goes bald to hairy. Uh, capillatus, uh, when the top of the cumulonimbus cloud is all completely glaciated, all ice crystals at the top. There's water droplets down the bottom, ice crystals at the top, and a huge mess, a, a um, tumble dryer of mess of um, mixture of ice and water uh, in the middle. And hail, of course, because these are the hail clouds and they're what produce thunder and lightning. From a distance away like this, or maybe like this, they can look really majestic and graceful. They're like a majestic expression of the architecture of our sky. But from down below, beneath the cumulonimbus cloud, it's a very different experience. There you're in the, in the, the heart of the storm down below, and they're buffeted by winds and, and hail, uh, drenched because these have very sudden and heavy downpours rather than kind of prolonged rain. And to me, this is interesting, not because just because they're the king of clouds, but just because they are beautiful to observe, but because when you're down below it, you are so aware of your connection to the atmosphere. It reminds you that we don't live beneath the sky, we live within the sky. All right, and that connection to the atmosphere is either connection to our surroundings. It's easy to lose that these days, where you feel you only really uh, experience, well, you know, you feel you experience things by watching them on uh, the computer, watching them on YouTube. You know, you need something visceral, a visceral connection with our surroundings, which I think these clouds provide uh, as an antidote to that modern malaise. So those three types of clouds, all right, cumulus, low, cirrus, high, cumulonimbus, which stretch from low to very high, are three fairly common types of clouds. They're pretty common, they're ten main types. Now let's move on to some rarer examples. How about this one? Very red um, projection of it. These things here, if you can just about make them out. Any thoughts from uh, the audience on what the, those ones might be? Aha! Volcano. It's not from a volcano, actually. That's Mount Rainier. Um, and it's not a volcanic. It's not, an a it's not a cloud of ash. Could be. Nice try, especially when it's got this Martian sort of colouring on it. Um, but it's not, no. Yes. Mackerel, it's not a mackerel sky, no. Nice try. Not a stratus. 
Lenticular cloud, absolutely right. <laughs> All right, for when you do the washing up. <coughs> I think it's your turn. Brilliant. Round of applause. Lenticular. <laughs> right, lenticularis is the Latin name. It's the Latin for uh, yeah, a lentil. All right, because these clouds, in fact, the full name here would be Alta Cumulus lenticularis. It's a species. All right, so the full name is that. But these clouds are often uh, look like sort of lenses or uh, they look like lentils. Here are some um, gray seals observing a sky of lenticularis clouds. They're all members of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Uh, it goes without saying. Um, and these clouds form, the way they form is kind of given in a, there's a kind of clue here. You've got mountains there, mountains in the uh, distance there, and here's a mountain here. And it's the mountain that is the crucial reason why these clouds form. Uh, here's a little diagram, all right? When um, an airstream, also known as wind, reaches a large obstacle, like a mountain, it has to rise to pass over it. And when conditions are right, a stable atmosphere it's called, this uh, wind in the lee of the peak can rise and dip and rise and dip uh, in a wave-like formation. It's a standing wave, all right? The wave's not traveling along with the wind. The wind's traveling, the wave is staying in place. And as it rises, it cools. And as it gets up to the top there here, the droplets, it's cooled enough for some of the moisture, the invisible moisture, the gas water in, in the air, because water is you know, in the form of gas in our air as water vapor. Some of it forms into a droplet, and that droplet rushes through the cloud with the wind, and then at the back where the clouds, sorry, through the cloud, yeah, when the, at the back where the wind starts to dip again, the air soon starts to dip, it warms and evaporates. So it's a little bit like this, all right, uh, and I'll get back to the explaining that, but it's a little bit like this, all right. This is when um, I did a, wrote a book about waves as well, and I went to Hawaii, two weeks in Hawaii, researching my book about waves, main reason for doing it. Um, and whilst I was on holiday, well, researching, uh, <laughs> uh, I went down the, uh, I was walking on the beach, Waimea Bay, and these locals were surfing on the river. There's a river of water where it had broken through the sand and was then coming down into the sea, and there was a standing wave, is what I'm talking about, a standing wave on the surface of the river, which they were surfing. And the standing wave is staying in place. It looks like this. All right, so here you go. You see next to the ground there, he's staying fixed. The water's rushing through. The, the position of this wave is staying in place there. And, and he, oh dear. All right. So that's to do with the uneven base of the river that it was flowing over, kicks it upwards, and it produces this, what's known as a standing wave. And exactly the same thing's happening in the air. Here is a uh, time-lapse video of a, um, of a lenticularis cloud, so looking up at it, and you'll see, uh, here we go. So you can see from the way the contrails, those aeroplane trails are moving along in the wind. That's the wind, but this is staying in place. The position of the wave stays fixed, even though the air is rushing through. Um, and these are the UFO clouds. I mean, you, uh, you sometimes see them, and they look, in fact, early black and white photographs of UFOs. Some of those are clearly lenticularis clouds. Um, this one was taken in Tenerife. I do like it when more than one person sends in to the society photographs um, of the same cloud. It was obviously sort of memorable enough for different people to photograph it. So there they've got from one side of Tenerife, uh, they photographed it. And then here, it looks like it's crashed from somebody else over the other side of Tenerife. Um, sometimes uh, these clouds can form actually over the top of the mountain. Cap cloud, they're known as then. So it's sort of actually sort of draped over the top. And sometimes clouds in this sort of this sort of way can form over the top of another cloud. So here you've got 
the big convection cloud, the storm cloud building up there, and then over the top of it has formed a, a pileus, Latin for a hat or a cap, and over the top of it, uh, as the air is being pushed up by this rising column of air in the middle of the cloud, pushes the airstream up that's blowing across the top, and that's just enough to cause a, a, a kind of delicate cap to form. So it's these are great ones to observe. You have to be somebody who looks at the sky to notice pileus clouds because they're there momentarily. Um, and you have to keep an eye out for them. Another a rare formation. Uh, in fact, we're going to get rarer. Um, this is slightly rarer is the full streak hole. So this whole layer of cloud um, is composed of water droplets, all right, but they're super cooled. They're really, really cold. They might be minus 15 degrees centigrade, Celsius. And they're very, very cold, but they haven't frozen. And that's because when you have a little droplet suspended in the air, it doesn't behave in the same way as water does down here in a glass. They haven't frozen. They're suspended in the air, and they need something to get going. And once freezing starts in one area, for whatever reason, the ice crystals that form there grow very, very quickly. They splinter, and they act as little seeds onto which all the droplets rush and start to freeze, and you get this chain reaction spreading outwards, uh, and the ice crystals forming grow large enough to fall down below as a streak. Sometimes you see them in a, like a long kind of uh, cigar shape like that, which is caused by an airplane, an aircraft flying up through the cloud layer. Uh, it sets off the freezing as it goes up through it. Rarer still, the mama clouds, named after the Latin for udders. It's true, um, that's not a joke, it's the Latin for udders, and because these pouches, ooh, wait a sec, these pouches of clouds hanging down um, below, they often hang down, the largest ones hang down underneath the, the big anvil shape of those storm clouds that I showed you earlier on. Um, so mama, uh, and then we're on to the horseshoe vortex cloud. This is very, very fleeting. It's an upside down horseshoe and it rotates um, and it doesn't hang around for very long at all. You sometimes see them in the vicinity of storms um, and it's not completely clear how they form. Something to do with updrafts kind of um, being sheared over by winds uh, and causing this kind of upside down uh, horseshoe. Unlucky for some, but lucky for a cloud spotter because they are, uh, they are rare. In fact, my little book, um, the first, well, one of the early books I did, you get points for the different ones you spot. Uh, you get quite a lot of points for those, but not the most points. The rarest, at least the rarest I've found from one sent in, uh, in terms of you look at how many are sent in from around the world, is the Kelvin Helmholtz wave cloud. <laughs> Looks like a series of breaking waves. That one over Hawaii. And this cloud is formed by the wind above the cloud and the wind below the cloud differ, all right? quite a lot, and that difference sets up this kind of undulating um, movement of the air in between, like a shearing effect. And if the difference in those two wind speeds is just right, the tops of those undulations curl over in these breaking wave-like appearing vortices. Um, and uh, you can see them at different heights in the atmosphere. Sometimes you can see them really quite low. These ones uh, this is a little video of some ones that formed um, in um, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I think it was a year or two ago. And some guys were filming them out the, at the window of their flat. In fact, I think one of them was doing some DIY at the time. Um, and they are marveling at the clouds. That's, I've never seen this before. Are you doing video? Bizarre. I have never seen this before. And I am doing video. That is Can correct. we please send it to James Spain in the Weather Channel and say, explain this? Oh my gosh. I really at first thought they're going to think I'm crazy because that looks like a wave. Oh my gosh. That's not why we think you're crazy, Stacy. I have Stacey. to go get my camera. That's not why we think you're crazy, Stacy. 
Um, so these, uh, these are rare clouds. Um, but the interesting point is this, all right? They're rare, but they're not that rare, all right? If you pay attention to the sky uh, on a regular basis, you'll see them. You'll see them maybe not as dramatic, uh, not taking up the whole sky in such a kind of dramatic uh, formation as, as those examples. You might see a bit of, cumulo uh, sorry, a bit of um, Kelvin Helmholtz wave clouds in a little portion of the sky. Um, and they're around. It's just a matter of noticing them. And so this, I think, is another interesting lesson right, that you get from clouds, which is that you don't have to kind of rush off across the world to find what's exotic. It's a shift in perspective. You can find the exotic in the everyday, in the mundane stuff around you. You don't have to rush to somewhere else, to some different place to be amazed. You just need to step outside and pay attention to the things that other people miss. Optical phenomena, all right? Um, optical phenomena. Now, uh, the interplay between the sunlight and the clouds is where the beauty is. And in many cases, when clouds are composed of ice crystals, there can be what are known as um, halo phenomena uh, appearing, which are, we've all used to seeing rainbows caused by the sunlight from behind you being cast directly onto a sheet of rain up ahead. It's very dramatic. It's easy to spot a rainbow. We all notice them the whole time because they're down in our field of vision and because of the the kind of chiaroscuro light effect of having sunlight onto a dark sky where the rain is falling is arresting. But there are many light effects which people miss, and some of these are as common as rainbows. For instance, these ones. Right, one more question. Anyone know what this optical effect is? is called, what the name of it is. Up at the back. Sun pillar, not quite, very close. Half, w half of it is right, the first half, yes? Solaris? Solaris, no. No, it's not a Solaris. Sun dog, absolutely right. Round of applause. The cloud that looks like th clouds that look like things book, signed copy, signed <laughs> copy. Well done. Um, sun dogs, they're also known as parhelia or mock suns. And these can form when you have a layer of ice crystals, a high ice crystal layer of cloud known as cirrostratus. stratus. Um, and as the sunlight passes through the ice crystals, they might produce these points of light, these bright spots of light on either side of the sun. When the ice crystals are of a particular um, shape and a particular purity, they have to have formed very, very slowly for them to have very regular shapes. Here is a more close-up uh, photograph of a, of a sun dog. It has a, a reddish uh, kind of yellowy red side and a, and a whiter side. And they form when the ice crystals, the minuscule microscopic ice crystals all the way up there in the cloud are shaped like hexagonal plates. And the sunlight passes down through one of these sides and through another um, when these plates are kind of horizontal. So they have to be in not only a certain shape, but they also have to be in a certain orientation, like falling, like kind of autumn leaves, cascading like that. And the sun has to be low for it to be able to go through the crystals in this kind of fashion and then hit your eye. Um, so you only see sun dogs when the sun is low in the sky. And about if you stretch your arm out and you have your thumb and little finger stretched out as much as possible. It's about that di distance, appear apparent distance from the sun on one or other side, depending on whether these ice crystal clouds are in both parts of the sky. 
Um, I like the way that this big um, optical effect on the sky that you see up large uh, gives us an indication of this most minute, this most intimate uh, nature of the little particles that make up the cloud. Um, and here is another example of um, a sun dog. So it's up there. Um, and you're probably wondering what that thing is there. Um, this is a video of from Cape Canaveral, I think it was. Uh, some people were filming a, a rocket going up, putting, an a, um, putting a, what do you call those things that go around the Earth? Uh, satellite, thank you very much. Putting a satellite up into orbit. Um, and it just so happened that that morning there was a sun dog, a high ice crystal layer of cloud, and there was a sun dog forming uh, up in the sky. And the people who were watching noticed as the rocket went through the layer of cloud, it sent off these sort of rippling shock waves. And you can just make it out. I hope we can in the, with this projection. I don't know. But you can just make it out, hopefully, this rippling shock waves, which um, knock the alignment of those crystals out. So rather than being in a horizontal formation, which is what's required for the optical effect to, to, to appear, they get knocked out. And then the sun dog disappears. Let's see if we can see it, hopefully. You see that? You can just about see it, right? The little ripples coming out. Um, there are many other uh, optical effects, like we're all familiar with um, crepuscular rays, those um, like fingers stretching down from the cloud. They feel like they are uh, sort of emanating from a point just here. But when they fan out like that, um, and they look like kind of torch beams coming down onto the surface of the, well, the sea there. In fact, this fanning out is because the uh, sunlight is coming towards you. It's uh, to do with perspective. Um, these beams are actually all parallel to each other. The sunlight's beams are effectively parallel when they reach the Earth. And... Uh, uh, and yet, because they're coming towards you, like train tracks coming towards you, you know, they, it, it sort of splays out the nearer it gets. So it has this sort of a feeling of, um, of kind of emanating from some imaginary point just behind the clouds there. The kind of very sort of uh, religious revelation sort of effect. Um, so we've all seen those, but how many have seen anti-crepuscular rays? You can't even see them on this projection here, unfortunately. So this is a bit of light cloud, light cloud. Um, light cloud, and you get these dark shadows going down here, um, which are known as anticrepuscular rays. They're in the opposite direction. So the sun is behind you, and you're looking towards the opposite hor horizon, and shadows of clouds up behind you are being cast across the high layer of cloud here to form these, in this case, they're, they're receding because of the perspective, the shadows going off into the distance, anticrepuscular rays. And then there's the, circ the circumzenithal arc. This is high up in the sky. It's like a, um, it's like a smile, really, um, produced again by, this doesn't look like a cloud, but it actually is a high uh, ice crystal cloud known as cirrostrata. It's very subtle, milky whitening of the sky. And when the crystals are right, you can see, uh, if you draw a circle around the zenith, the part of that circle, the arc that's down towards the sun, again, it's got to be low in the sky. The arc towards the sun can have this sort of upside-down rainbow effect of the rainbow colors. Um, yeah, it was uh, this idea of the imagination and a shift in perspective um, is kind of partly why I think these optical effects are interesting, because, um, you know, most people don't notice them, because most of us are looking down on the ground. You know, when you're stressed, you're under pressure. For some reason, you kind of look down. I don't know why that is. At least you like the weight of this idea, the weight of the world on your shoulders. You know, you're kind of pet you're walking around like that. And so it's a good, I think it's a, just a good thing to look up as a kind of counter to that. But... Um, but, you know, most people don't notice these optical effects. They don't notice a bright rainbow, dramatic bright rainbow, uh, upside down, high in the sky when it's not raining. 
they miss it because they're not looking up. Um, and I think that's a sort of, again, there's a lesson there which is just the shift in perspective sometimes is, is all that's required to, to find out something new. You don't need to kind of consume more, chase things. You just need to change the perspective on what's already around you, what's close by. Um, and that is rather nicely... Uh, demonstrated in a way by um, there's some there's a writer who I think it, it writes very very well about the sky Henry David Thoreau um, the American author and um, in his journals he writes a lot about clouds um, and very eloquently uh, and there's an really interesting point which is really that, that this is just an observation he wrote in his um, journal in 1851 it was which um, was you know looking off towards the sunset. Uh, and just thinking about what he saw, I think it kind of demonstrates it in a way. Between two stupendous mountains of the low stratum under the evening red, clothed in slightly rosaceous amber light, through a magnificent gorge, far, far away, as perchance may occur in pictures of the Spanish coast viewed from the Mediterranean, I see a city, the eternal city of the West, the phantom city in whose streets no traveler has trod, over whose pavements the horses of the sun have already hurried, some Salamanca of the imagination. I went uh, to Australia to see a cloud, um, uh, which seems like an odd thing to do, but uh, it all came about because I was leafing through a book, um, a book about clouds, as you do, um, some photographs, and it was an old book, and I noticed this black and white photograph of this roll cloud. All right, roll clouds are like a tube uh, of cloud that can stretch a long distance. Uh, and I thought, that looks quite, you know, this, the ro waves going off in the distance, the lovely cloud formation. And I read about it, and it said, the morning glory cloud. All right, the fanciful name of this phenomenon conveys the feeling of elation which its passage arouses. Um, so I thought, that's quite Good, you know, a cloud being named after the feeling of elation that its passage arouses. Um, and I thought, you know, that sounds a bit, I'd like to go and see the morning glory cloud, but um, then I read that uh, it forms in Burketown in northern Queensland. All right, so I thought maybe that is a bit too far away to go see a, a cloud, and I sort of forgot about that idea, but then it, it sort of popped up every now and then in the way things can, and I started becoming more interested in it because I discovered that glider pilots, they surf this cloud, just like surfers on an ocean wave, regular surfers on an ocean wave, because it forms inside a, a, an invisible wave of air which travels along. Right, this, this cloud travels um, across this part of Australia, the Gulf of Carpentaria, up in the top of Australia. Burke Town is kind of central, just on the coast, uh, or just inland from the coast there. And it travels across the Gulf of Carpentaria through the night uh, and arrives at land uh, in the morning. Uh, and these glider pilots, I learned and read, uh, they hang out there. During the time of year when the cloud forms, the uh, springtime, which of course is September, October time in Australia, they go and they hang out there and wait for the cloud to arrive so they can go up and surf on it. And I thought that sounds kind of, that sounds like a sort of a cloud version of the Big Wednesday or something. I liked the idea of it and I managed to wangle things to go out to see it. All right, it's sort of to write an article, do some things for little films for Channel 4, uh, get Qantas to pay for my flight, all this sort of thing. I managed to wangle it to go out there. All right, two weeks in Burketown um, to wait at the, at the time when it's supposed to form this cloud and I hope that it was going to come. All right, and here is the main high street in Burketown. Uh, 178 people live there, um, and it's one of those places where the flying doctor comes once a week. Uh, uh, they've got uh, one pub, uh, they've got a, a restaurant, licensed morning glory restaurant, closed for the two weeks I was there. <laughs> they have one pub, post office, and a kind of cafe. Um, and so I got there and 
met some uh, gliders. I'm not a glider, I don't fly or anything like that. I just met them and we were hanging out and chatting, all very nice. And so I would go out each morning because the cloud arrives very, very early in the morning. Um, uh, it comes in kind of phases and you, you, know, you get a gap and then you get one, two, three mornings in a row. Um, so I get up very, very early, like um, before it got light, about four in the morning. Not, I'm not much of a morning person, so that was a problem in itself. And I would go out onto the savannah, all right? Um, it's a very, very flat part of Australia here, um, Gulf Savannah region. And uh, I'd go out there and I'd look off towards the northeastern sky, the northeastern horizon, in the hope of seeing a cloud on the horizon, right? This line, which was the first indication that the morning glory cloud was coming. Um, and, uh, and it didn't come. Each morning I would stand out there and uh, each morning there'd be no cloud and then um, just hang around for the rest of the day. Well, that was all right. I didn't really mind that. It was quite nice. But um, as time went on, I started getting a bit more stressed because I sort of had assumed that I was going to see this cloud and everything was sort of riding on it. I couldn't come back and say, sorry, here's your camera back. I couldn't film anything or I didn't, uh, the, the article, I can't write it because nothing happened. Um, thought it was all a bit awkward. So I started feeling quite stressed out about it, actually. And then, you know, there in the, in the post office, these photographs on the wall of morning glory clouds kind of taunting me when I would go in there to send a postcard. Someone suggested to me, you should um, go and speak to Dawn. All right, Dawn is the Aboriginal lady who lives on Bentink Island with some other... Um, uh, elder ladies, and uh, they, uh, she knows a dance, they told me. Bentink Island, just, uh, just off the coast, she knows a dance, the Wamor dance, which is a dance that brings the wind that carries the morning glory. Desperate at this stage, do you know what I mean? So, right, Dawn, fine, that sounds good. <laughs> Went over there. <laughs> sounds good, bring it on. Went over there. Uh, here's Dawn. I did a little film of this. I can show you the little film of, of, the, um, of the cloud of the, when it actually, what happened. But um, uh, here's Dawn, this is in a different film. Um, uh, and she's sort of doing her dance and just involved sort of stamping and clapping. I have to sort of do it like that so you get the effect. Do you know what I mean? Stamping, clamping, so sh uh, clapping, stamping, shouting. Um, and, uh, you know, so then I went back, all right, this is, I suppose, maybe a week and a half through my two weeks, and I went back, all high hopes for the next morning, and it didn't come. And, uh, and I thought, oh, God. But the thing was that people in the town had um, told me that there were a couple of signs, a couple of little signals to keep an eye out for, which can be an indication that there's enough moisture in the air for the morning glory cloud to form. All right. One of them is in the pub, the beer fridge is missed up. The other one, in the cafe, the tables, which are kind of laminated on one side and not the other or something, I don't know how it works, but they bend. They kind of curl upwards in the corners. And so there I was, sort of depressed that next morning, feeling more and more stressed out. And I went into the pub. All right, you can't quite see it, but misted, that was misted. In the cafe, all right, the tables curling. And the cloud came the next morning, all right. The first one came when it was dark, and so the glider pilots couldn't go up. But the next day, um, it came. As I said, it comes in a series usually of sort of three or four days. Um, and each time, apparently, it comes a bit later in the day. This is sort of the pattern. So the next day um, after, it came uh, late enough when it was light so the gliders could go up. And I filmed them, and we taped a camera onto the back of one of their gliders. Um, don't tell Channel 4. Uh, onto the back of their gliders with gaffer tape so you could film down the thing. Uh, and uh, five minutes, yeah. And then we... Um, uh, and so we, we, we uh, did that and I interviewed them. Anyway, here you are, cloud surfing, glider style. These glider pilots are about to go surfing, surfing on a wave of air which forms around a cloud called the morning glory. The cloud is in the shape of an enormous tube and rolls in at first light over the coast of Queensland from Australia's Gulf of Carpentaria. It offers what's got to be the most exciting gliding experience in the world. You 
get on it, come over the face and you can surf down, you can have a wing in the cloud and surf right down to the bottom edge. With the absolute smoothness, being able to travel at high speed, the barest movements of the controls, that's completely different to how you normally fly a glider. Very often you'll get a, a very strong primary cloud which rolls along very quickly. You can jump back from the, the first primary wave often to secondary and third, fourth and extend it like that. There's times when I, I reckon I've probably done about 500 kilometres. The chances of something bad happening are, are high. If you're flying at quite low altitudes over um, remote areas and they're full of crocodiles. If a surfer were to, to go um, too far into the back end of the wave, he wipes out equally. We wipe out too, but I think with um, probably more disastrous consequences. I think you'd only have maybe a dozen people uh, in the world that really have done it. It is unique, that's for sure. The word hasn't spread much yet. It's good to share it with everybody, but I wouldn't like to see it becoming like a traffic jam. Generally 10 or 15 minutes into the flight that the sun comes across the top of the cloud. And uh, when you look back at that site with this fantastic golden sun breaking behind it, it's, uh, you'd swear that you're in heaven. It's that good. <laughs> So um, I don't think you can. I don't think you can have a society without having a manifesto, all right, saying what you stand for. And so, from a very early stage in Cloud Appreciation Society, I uh, wrote a manifesto, um, and uh, I will end with that. Um, in fact, someone told me that if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, it's really good to number the items. Right, it gets the audience much more excited and engaged. So that's what I've done here, all right? So the manifesto of the Cloud Appreciation Society. Number one, we believe that clouds are unjustly maligned and life would be immeasurably poorer without them. Number two, <laughs> we think that clouds are nature's poetry and the most egalitarian of her displays since everyone can have a fantastic view of them. Number three, we pledge to fight blue sky thinking wherever we find it. Life would be dull if we had to look up at cloudless monotony day after day. Number four, we seek to remind people that clouds are expressions of the atmosphere's moods and can be read like those of a person's countenance. Number five, we believe that clouds are for dreamers and their contemplation benefits the soul. Indeed, all who consider the shapes they see in them will save money on psychoanalysis bills. <laughs> and so we say to all who listen, look up, marvel at the ephemeral beauty, and always remember to live life with your head in the clouds. Thank you very much. Thank you.